Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. I know y'all are tired from last night. Good morning. Good morning. Hande Onde Bakbom. Uh, I have the distinct honor of introducing into our space our keynote speaker today. But before I begin, I want to invite on stage to share space with us Dr. Christine Nelson, Dr. Robin Minthorn, Dr. Natalie Youngbull, and Charlie Scott. So as I said, I have the distinct honor of introducing and inviting into this space our keynote speaker today, Dr. Sandy Grande. Now, if you all were expecting me to adhere to the typical conference protocol of reading Sandy's bio, replete with academic appointments, titles, lists of publications and awards, all that we've come to expect in conference keynote introductions, you may have come to the wrong keynote. Those of you who are familiar with Sandy's scholarly commitments, this indigenous scholar who gifted us with red pedagogy and a decolonial love letter on refusing the university, will not be surprised that she has no interest or investment in the inducements of such academic posturing. In fact, she instructed me that I could say whatever I want about her, but was insistent about two things. One, that I not list her publications. And two, that I honor her relationship with indigenous scholars in this space, particularly Stephanie Waterman, Amanda Tacchini, and myself. I'll get to number two in a minute. So in honoring uh, Sandy's instructions, let me share a little bit about her. Uh, Sandy is a Quechua national. She has provided elder care for her parents for over 10 years and remains the primary caregiver for her 93-year-old father. She likes to cuss a little, and I love that about her. She dances like nobody else. Uh, and she's fun and brilliant. Her thinking, rooted in deep commitments to decolonization, has and continues to inspire and sustain generations of indigenous communities and scholars, urging us for what she describes as renewed thinking about the relationship between radical and decolonial struggles. She is a relative to so many of us. And she's a professor of political science and Native American and Indigenous Studies at the University of Connecticut. She told me it was okay if I included that. As a relative, Sandy seeks to honor her relationships with Indigenous scholars in particular spaces. She acknowledges that the only reason that she is here is because of us, telling us that her presence is made by our presence. And she reminds us that after her keynote, or rather her unkeynote, she will leave and we will continue to hold space for indigenous scholars at ASH. She reminds us to honor our relationship and genealogy, to honor the ancestral line of knowledge keepers, culture bearers, relatives, and scholars from whom we descend. It is their knowledge, their love, strength, and teachings that we carry with us. Our presence is made by their presence. And as we consider our presence, it is important to reflect on our emergence in these spaces. In preparing for this keynote, Sandy invited us to be in community with her, to think alongside her, and to provide a collective sharing of knowledge offerings, to honor our relational connections and responsibilities to one another and our shared stories. We invite into the space our sister, Dr. Stephanie Waterman. In the before time, I met Dr. Heather Schaden at NASPA. It was just the two of us for what seemed like a very long time at Ash and NASPA conferences. Then along came other scholars, like Dr. Robin Minthorn, Dr. Chris Nelson. And if I keep naming people, I will leave someone out, and that wouldn't be a good thing. Our stories of emergence serve to help us remember 
to center our existence in these spaces and provide us with instruction. They also serve to disrupt our erasure and the continued insistence on our undoing in the academy. We tell our stories to remind you that as indigenous people, we have always been here, no matter how hard you try to forget us. It's been a hard journey. We've lost some young scholars, Dr. Arthur Taylor and Dr. Danielle Terrance, for example, and family members. We've had to explain the same thing a hundred times and feel the weight of patriarchy and settler colonialism. I'm tired. Personally, I mourn the future while the planet burns as leadership fights over student enrollment and the business as usual facade during this pandemic. But there's hope. Look at how many of us there are now. Our large and strong family has grown. We're here, still here, challenging the status quo and building our field. We share our stories to make visible the struggles and to make space for possibilities. Because despite the struggles, the loss, the injuries, the pain, we have no choice but to survive. So we pause and hold space so that we can mourn. And then we can embrace the mourning and our responsibilities to carry on and dream into existence new futures. Futures where, our, where we readily take up indigenous ways of knowing and being. I wanna take this time to thank my dear friend, Sandy Grande for providing a space for us as Indigenous scholars to collectively share this keynote stage. Sandy approached us with intentions to knit together a collective voice that moves us away from a keynote from only being one person. As Indigenous peoples, this is the way we often move through life as a collective. It's beautiful in that way. When we can take up indigenous ways of knowing in spaces and places that too often dislodge us from the way we see and move through the world. A hat, Sandy, for moving us here. Because we have always been and will always continue to be here. So today, we stand alongside Sandy to honor our teachings, calling into this space our ancestors, those who have journeyed on before us, our knowledge keepers, past, present, and future, and the generations yet to come, to bear witness and honor our stories. And now we invite into the space our relative, Dr. Sandy Grande. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, and thank you so much, Heather, uh, and all the women up here, and Stephanie and Amanda for participating in that. Um, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. So good morning, buenos dias, Puerto Rico, uh, Boriquen, Boriqueños, Ayanchu, Ayanmi, Buenas tardes, Sweetie Sandy Grande. It's really lovely to be here. Uh, and as we all know, none of this happens without the tremendous labor effort and commitment of so, so many people. I'm sure the Ash Site Committee, the hotel and convention center staff, and I especially wanna thank uh, Jason Gilbao for working on uh, so many different fronts uh, and putting up with me. I really appreciate that. And of course, I wanna extend a heartfelt thank uh, to D.L. Stewart, who for so many of us has served as a beacon in this field. I can't imagine all the different needles you had to thread to organize this conference in the middle of a raging pandemic, global climate disaster, student strikes, and just general everyday colonialist duckery, I will say for now. Uh, we see you, we appreciate you, we acknowledge your badassery, DL. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be honest with you, I struggled to find the right words to share today. 
This is my first in-person talk, my first conference, my first flight, my first travel away from my 90-year-old dad who I've lived with and cared for since the beginning of the pandemic. Part of me is ecstatic to be here, to go back to what was once a regular practice and site of learning, inspiration, and camaraderie. And I'm not gonna lie, poolside sipping. Especially for bi POC, queer, and trans scholars who might be the only in their programs, their departments, or even their university, conferencing was always a time to connect and commiserate, to span and unsettle the borders of our isolation and containment. So part of me feels good at the same time, all of me understands that we're not on the other side of this, and more pointedly, that there may not be another side. Over five million people have died from COVID. This is more people than live on the entire island of Puerto Rico or roughly the population of the entire island of Ireland. 750,000 of those deaths were in the United States, which is about the same as the population of Washington, D.C., which after the most recent election cycle, maybe it's something to ponder. And infection rates are rising in states like Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Nebraska. The U.S. holds the distinction of having the most COVID deaths of anywhere in the world, this despite being among the first to procure the vaccine in all of our subsequent hoarding. So while we're here sipping on our pina coladas and coquitos, which are really good by the way, it's important to remind ourselves that the pandemic rages on, as do the flows of racial capitalism and settler colonialism, and that this 500 year of flow is our normal. So if and whenever we are back, what that means to so many of us is that we are back to conditions of unceasing violence and dispossession. Some of it spectacular, the kind that makes headline news, and some of it quotidian, the banalities of evil that unfold in broad daylight under the rule of law and within the bounds of order. Because that order is contingent upon the continual denial of our humanity. So I don't want this moment to pass without making, marking the gravity of the past two years of the death, the stress, the loneliness, the disconnection, the losses and vulnerabilities, and to underscore the need for this time to be properly grieved, to understand that its denials and elisions have consequences, especially for those who continue to suffer and endure the losses. I chose to entitle my talk, Pedagogies of Mourning and Mourning, because I want to un unsettle both as sites of praxis and the radical imagination. They're not simply interconnected, but deeply constitutive spaces. In Quechua, we have the concept of chi, which that expresses how the state and dialectics of tension and antagonism are necessary and ontological. In other words, there's no life without death, no joy without sadness, no love without indifference, and no creation without destruction. My words today are gonna unfold in interludes um, because if your pandemic time was anything like my pandemic time, it was like one big nonlinear mashup. In between the interludes, I'm gonna ask you to repeat a refrain with me. For those of you that are observant, it'll be like in mass or services. And for the non-observant, it'll be a frame like in music, especially jazz. So that's the refrain there, spanning, unsettling, and abolishing borders. And again, for those of you that observe it and go to services, when they go like this from the pulpit, that's when you're supposed to say the refrain. So let's practice. It's the, I'll tell you one more time. It's spanning, unsettling, and abolishing borders. Spanning and unsettling and abolishing borders. Not bad. Okay. I'm going to begin with excerpts from my current work, which is on indigenous elders and aging and then do the crosswalk from there, articulating how this work has shaped my ideas about the university, about its own life and death. So I realize all the talk of death might, might kill the ash vibe a bit, <laughs> but I want us to consider what it would mean to not talk about death in this moment and encourage you to listen in a different register, to accept this offering as a prelude, to hear it in the tune and the tone of promise. Interlude number one. Death is the end of everything and nothing. It has the power to stop both breath and life, while also expanding space and time. 
Whether the loss of a family member, a beloved colleague, a head of state, the home, the workplace, the nation, all lumber relentlessly onward. I experience this paradox, the dissonance between the temporalities of life and those of death, most acutely when embedded in the catastrophic spaces of elder care, riding in ambulances, waiting in the ER, holding vigil in the intensive care unit. These spaces envelop an air so thick that it compresses movement and sound. It's like being underwater. We struggle to keep afloat while people on the outside continue to walk, laugh, and play and love as usual, as if death wasn't imminent. This is the work of crisis, to amplify at the same time it conceals. In its broadest sense, my new work is about the death of my beloved mother, Ona, a Quechua elder, and the profound impact her life, illness, and passing has had on my understanding of the world. More specifically, it presupposes that there's something to be learned about the colonial present through the study of aging and late life. I'm particularly interested in how dominant systems of care and governance encode and dispatch settler colonialist imperatives, which in turn help to produce a narrative of aging as crisis. To be sure, this discourse is animated by the momentous rise in the global population of older adults, which has doubled over the past 40 years and is poised to triple by 2050. In the United States, baby boomers aged 65 years and older will outnumber children by the year 2030. These unprecedented demographic shifts are being referenced through a variety of sobriquets, the age invasion, the silver tsunami, the gray dawn, all which signal an air of crisis, a capitalist panic that we are not only facing a future that is significantly older, but also one alarmingly less productive. The most dire forecasts imagine that the coming, quote, demographic storm will pose such a strain on existing systems that the economy will plunder, innovation will stagnate, and millennials will become so overburdened with declining wages and rising entitlements that they will incite a generational war. Against this framing, I pose a counterfactual. What if instead of crisis, we imagine global aging as a condition of possibility? What if we consider the rising tide of older adults as a portal or conceptual opening that forces a fundamental reconsideration of the central dichotomies and contradictions of settler society built on the exigencies of capital? That is the conflation of work with existence, of economic growth with production, of production to wage labor, and of old age with declining yield. My interest in elders and aging as an intellectual project began around 2005 when I joined the growing legion of 65.7 million caregivers in the United States. While my aging parents were never sick at the same time, their turn taking extended the demands of intensive caregiving over the better part of a decade. The love labor was arduous, and at times, I buckled under the weight. But ultimately, we were emboldened and amplified by the responsibility, by the purpose of tendering co collectivity. Together we gripped tightly and pushed back and refused the indignities of a system, not only intent on devouring the last of Ona's life, but also our existence, ultimately providing care or the work to let live, as well as hospicing, doing the work to let die, proved deeply meaningful, transforming, and generative. In the aftermath of Ona's passing, I still feel the presence and com company of her love and lessons, but there's also an unmistakable residue of resentment. I resent how her status as elder was rendered illegible by a system where older adults are considered little more than human surplus. I resent the abject indifference, the politics of disposability, the predatory marketers, the apathy and disregard she was forced to endure in pursuit of care. And over time, I become increasingly troubled by how her desire to die with dignity was also thieved by the unrelenting undertow of crisis surrounding death in settler society. At the time, we knew that struggling against an undertow is futile. The more you fight, the more it drags you down. But when terror meets frailty meets calamity, the impulse to resist is visceral and instinctive, and we thrashed. Everyone but Ona, that is. She never did. She never relented to the predators. My work is inspired by her indomitable spirit and animated by the rage and love of caring in apocalyptic times. With this work, my aim is to build upon indigenous relations of care and kinship and other forms of radical care to develop a decolonial praxis that affirms life, behind, life beyond the imperial logics of the settler state. The operating assumption is that such modes of care not only represent the antidote to violence, but also the elsewhere of indigenous resurgence and liberation. <laughs> 
To be clear, elsewhere as it's employed here, it's not meant as an adverb qualifying an unspecified place or utopian otherworld, but rather as a proper noun. It's an ontology that is at once prior to, outside of, and beyond settler space time, a material reality and lived existence that is distinctive from the decolonial imaginary that Billy Ray Belcourt describes as a politics of the future perfect. While grounded in the journeys of elders in late life, the elsewhere is also not a dystopian zone of decline, illness, death, trauma, or grief. Rather, it's theorized as a site of mourning, the space-time just after the dawn, when once obscured, alighted, and disavowed, becomes perceptible again, <clears throat> bringing a renewed sense of being into the world. Interlude two. Lately, we've heard a lot about crisis. The fiscal crisis, the supply and chain crisis, the labor and frontline worker crisis, the shipping gas and even toilet paper crisis. We witness the disastrous effects of the climate crisis, the crisis at the border, the crisis of homelessness, violent crime, opioid use, and domestic violence. All the while, rages of racism and white supremacy rage on, cycling through familiar registers of anti-Asian and Asian-American racism, anti-immigrant xenophobia, anti-black violence, and indigenous erasure, and more recently, to the realms of anti-science and even anti-truth. Of course, none of these are really crises as they are named, of shipping, of public health, et cetera. Rather, they're crises of capitalist greed, of colonialist dispossession, of extraction, overaccumulation, and uncaring. Students in Puerto Rico know this. They know that the so-called fiscal crisis is not of their making, but rather the result of centuries of colonialist rule. They know that the most recent wave of austerity measures, the tuition hikes, union busting, work speed ups, labor precarities, and administrative bloat, are not moments of aberration or deviation from the usual, but rather that the university as such was designed around and built upon debt. Craig Wilder, author of Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, traces how the academy was both a beneficiary and defender of the same social and economic forces that transformed the American West and Central Africa. He writes, American colleges were not innocent or passive beneficiaries of conquest and colonial slavery. The European invasion of the Americas and the modern slave trade pulled peoples through the Atlantic world into each other's lives and colleges were among the colonial institutions that braided their histories and rendered their fates dependent and antagonistic. The academy never stood apart from American slavery. In fact, it stood beside church and state as a third pillar of a civilization built on bondage. In extending Wilder's work, I theorized the university as an arm of the settler state, which means rather than ask whether the current arrangements of power constitute an unprecedented phase or crisis, I examine how the initial dispossession and enslavement of indigenous and black peoples has given rise to a settler nation and universities that are predisposed to replicate relations of domination. This is why scholars of abolition and decolonization question the efficacy of reform, of reform measures framed by diversity and inclusion and the liberal idea that settler society and the university are redeemable, are perfectible, if we can only stay involved, remain optimistic, go high when they go low, we will continue to make progress. But given that the university is over a thousand years old and is still marked by its formative exclusions, it's pretty evident that liberal reform measures are not the answer. As noted by Robin Kelly, the idea that simply adding darker faces, safer spaces, better training in a curriculum that acknowledge historical and contemporary oppressions can radically transform the truly racialized social and epistemological architecture upon which the modern university is built is a bit like asking for more black police officers as a strategy to curb state violence. In other words, the basis of the imperfectibility is not bad individual actors or even ill-conceived policies, but rather the literal and metaphoric ground upon which we and the university sit. If we're sincere in our desire to decolonize, we might begin by abandoning the presupposition that decolonization will materialize through more and deeper allegiance to liberal theories of justice, to making the university great again. Especially when there's ample evidence that the raison d'etre of liberalism has always been to discipline, eclipse, and domesticate the radical imagination. 
Stated differently in grafting off DL's work, it's not possible for the university to diversify and include its way out of white supremacy. The constitutive inequities don't just emanate from the original bounty of thief land and labor, but also come from the massive dividends paid out to white and franchised citizens from multiple generations. Consider, for example, that the University of California remained tuition free until 1966, when Governor Reagan explicitly imposed fees as a means of disciplining campus agitators. I'll say that one more time. The University of California remained tuition free until 1966. Tuition for California residents today has risen to $14,000, which amounts to an increase of over 2,000% in 45 years. Here in Puerto Rico, tuition has been raised by an astounding 87% for public four-year universities. Enter the so-called student debt crisis. While Republicans are mainly responsible for the widening gaps, divestment in higher education has been a national bipartisan effort. Indeed, if the data reveals anything, it's that the hard fought for increases in educational access have ultimately widened economic inequality, especially for first gen and by POC students, typically the par targets of predatory loans. The neoliberal restructurings of the 1980s only exacerbated pre existing endemic conditions. Recently, the Center for American Progress estimated that higher education will need a $46 billion bailout just to become solvent again. But as always, the impact is not evenly distributed. Elite institutions, which is to say the greatest benefactors of stolen land and labor, were not only survived these pandemic times, but are seeing historic gains in their endowments and investment portfolios. Harvard reported a $283 million surplus. Columbia's endowment grew 30% to a healthy $14.35 billion. And Yale is posting a $276 million surplus and a $31.2 billion endowment. Meanwhile, the total allocation for the Bureau of Indian Education for supporting all higher and post-secondary education for Native students in 2020 was $98 million. In other words, assuming stable rates, Yale's endowment could fund every single tribal college and technical school for the next 318 years. Such staggering disparities call to mind Glenn Cuthard's entreaty. For indigenous peoples to live, capitalism must die. Here it's important to note that capitalism is more than an economic system, it's an ideology, a logic of extraction, accumulation, and dispossession that produces an affective economy built upon the seductive promises of inclusion and recognition. If you have any doubts, try refusing the, quote, gift of belonging and suffer the social isolation, institutional marginalization, the ghosting, and sometimes even retribution. While we might rightfully fear the impact of exclusion on self, on career, on family, on community, we need to also consider the price of belonging. What are the costs of being invited to the table, of being included in the dialogue, of being the first, the only, to being singled out as one of the good ones? Interlude three. The pandemic ravaged whatever illusions were left about America. <clears throat> As it cascaded over its acolytes like a tsunami surfacing the inner debris of their once thought of paradise. They watched in horror as we took in images of shuttered storefronts, besieged nursing homes, and frontline workers in hazmat suits loading piled high corpses into mobile morgues. And then there were the earthquakes, the bushfires, the desert locusts, and murder hornets. All of it felt apocalyptic and at times kind of shit. Then January 6 happened, <clears throat> the day when armed Trump loyalists stormed the US Capitol in a cathartic exercising of fomented rage. Despite the prior four years or five centuries of demagoguery, reports of the attack surfaced through the discourses of shock and awe. Flemish citizens and journalists looking ashen as they repeated the all too common refrain, this is not who we are, this is not America. Apparently dreams die hard particularly when fueled by the vast super and infrastructures of the hegemonic order. So while some of us has taken, some have taken to disasterizing this historical juncture as a revival of white nationalism, as a proud white death cult, or even as the end of democracy, to me, it feels more like the death throes of settler hegemony. I didn't know what the death throes were until I hospiced Dona. 
when the balance of one t one's time is spent in and out of hospitals, nursing homes, and palliative care centers, you see a lot of death. And contrary to Hollywood depictions, few go peacefully. Sometimes there's a period of terminal lucidity or what some perceive as an end of life rally, but eventually persons fall into a state of increased agitation, confusion, and general disquiet as the end draws near. There's often an episode of particularly distressing delirium that comes along with multiple organ failure. They look as though they're fighting their last war on earth and losing. These are the death throes. So I wonder if we reframe January 6th as the last gasp of a dying regime, of a day when the multiple organs of settler democracy failed, or more accurately self-destructed in a cannibalistic melee. We might be more prone to think about it, to dream about what comes next. We have multiple rituals of death when a loved one passes, but what are there what are the opposite rituals for the death of an idea? If indeed the idea of America has reached the end of its life and along with it the myths of multiculturalism, meritocracy, and human supremacy, as well as their legitimating apparatuses, the school, the, public, the pulpit, the university, how do we let them die? Do we hold a memorial service, a wake, a funeral? Who delivers the eulogy? Do we look the other way and let them endure a slow and painful death? Do we orchestrate a mercy killing or jump it with defibrillation paddles, bringing it back to life? Or maybe we take it out back and slay it gangster style. <laughs> Whatever the case, I know that the absence of any proper acknowledgement or reckoning leaves a lot of damage in its wake. False hope, prolonged grief, unrequited rage. Death or more precisely finitude is anathema to a settler society built on expansion. The multi-billion dollar anti-aging business that includes everything from cosmeceuticals and life extending technologies to the more quixotic dreams of the so-called metaverse are all testament to the desperate search for eternal life. And for settler dreamers, there is no life without conquest. The recent fair, fanfare around the battle of the space barons serves as a case in point. The sheer spectacle of the billionaire boys waving their rockets around almost makes one long for the Cold War jingoism of the 1970s post-Sputnik space race. Unlike their predecessors, the dueling astropreneurs aren't representative of a national investment in science, or even one giant leap for mankind. Rather, this highly mediated and produced um, rivalry of the space barons was about boosting egos, brands, and colonialist fantasies, a multi-planetary conquest that would make both Freud and Andrew Jackson blush. It's all of that, and it's about the denial of death. Post-growth economist Tim Jackson draws relationships among consumer capitalism, the myth of the infinite frontier, and pervasive deep-seated anxieties about death. Building upon Ernest Becker's theorization of modern society's hedonistic compulsions and obsession with the comforts of life as a sublimation of fears about death, he writes, capitalism is a massive comfort blanket designed to help us never confront the mortality that waits us all. Interlude four. Standing unsettling, abolishing borders. <clears throat> Recently I wrote the words, care and freedom are one and the same. Care and freedom are one in the same. Care and freedom are one in the same. As I ruminate on these words, their pairing feels both revelatory and insufficient, and make me think about the aphorism, no one is free until all of us are free. Particularly in these times when inequities have only worsened, I wonder if such musings actually hold up against lived experience. For example, is it really true that Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and Mark Zuckerberg are not free because most of the rest of us are unfree? Because they seem pretty damn free. It's clearly more accurate to say that few of us are free because the vast majority are made, of us are made unfree. I understand the underlying existential claim that freedom won at, at the expense of others is not really real freedom. But for me, the existing conditions and material violences of unfreedom far outweigh any imagined existential crisis among the billionaire class. In this sense, the Occupy Wall Street slogan, we are the 99%, seems more effective. It marks the gross inequality at the same time it galvanizes class consciousness and collective resistance. Freedom is won through the solidarities of struggle. In other words, it helped to shift the pedagogical question from its prior preoccupation with the subject of freedom, who is free, to the more urgent question of how do we get free? <laughs> 
assuming care and collectivity are prerequisites to freedom. I want to consider the necessary and optimal conditions for their cultivation, which is to say the pedagogy and praxis of liberation. If, for example, care is the interstitial tissue of collectivity, then we need to think more deliberately about how we learn to care. And in the context of the US state, how do we generate, curate, and sustain caring relations within systems predicated upon violence? I frame the problematic as pedagogical because the system and structures of colonialism and racial capitalism themselves encode a persistent episteme. In addition to their radical severings and disconnections, mind from body, affect from reason, human from other than human, the overvaluing of fast, presentist, and impulsive function as the mode and method of the hegemonic realignment, the reductive universalizing and collapse, collapsing of epistemicide. Alongside and in service of this imperial realignment came the vast infrastructure of schooling that imposed, oftentimes violently, the lessons of empire. The hegemonic ideas about ever-expanding, supreme, and infinite life were taught explicitly in early conduct books like the McGuffrey Reader and the New England Primer, and are reflected in today's prohibitions on the teachings of US history and uncomfortable ideas, and of the resuscitation of the great replacement theory, or conspiratorial idea that white people are being supplanted by racial and ethnic minorities. Thus, any project that purports to contest an end to settler capitalist hegemony, but doesn't take, undertake the pedagogical question, will always remain deeply limited. Stated differently, in order to secure more liberatory futures, we must both refuse and radically reconceive the modes of knowledge and knowledge production that gave rise to imperialist epistemes in the first place. In addition to engaging decolonial and anti-colonial thought, we need to acknowledge, sustain, and advocate for the broad universe of indigenous and other excluded knowledges. Within this project, I argue that elder ways of knowing and being will prove both vital and critical. Elderly bodies, by virtue of their very being, enact proxies of interdependency, deliberation, and slowness in ways that deeply challenge and outright, outright refuse settler capitalist logics of independent, impulsive, and fast. Their embrace and embodiment of indeterminacy and contingency teaches us to yield rather than master, to linger rather than bypass, and to accept the truth of interdependence against the myth of rabid individualism. In so doing, elders not only animate new questions about the meaning of life and death, but also the nature of knowledge and of living the practice of freedom. The question at hand isn't about the value of their lessons, but rather how to create conditions for their teachings to be more broadly legible and regarded. As the greed and animus of the extractive class plunders us, deep, plunders us deeper into catastrophe, this is perhaps the most critical pedagogical question of our time. Interlude five. It's important to note, as Astra Taylor offers, that the increasingly stratified, segregated, and costly university is not the future. It's simply the default setting. While default settings are hardwired and pervious to reform, they aren't immune to change. It just means that the change will always be temporary and tenuous, and thus we need a serious reckoning with how we expend our resources and labor. It means we need to stop presuming that virtue will prevail, that more committees, listening sessions, task forces, action research, and reports will make a difference, or even that more data and evidence will matter. Because when the police can kill black men, women, and children, sometimes in broad daylight, with witnesses and cameras rolling, and still not be held accountable for murder, when Indians are still made to disappear, and when the destruction of the planet is happening in real time and is still denied, we are living in a time beyond evidence. So it's not time for more debate, dialogue, patience, loving thy enemy, turning the other cheek, speaking in measured tones, talking it over, hugging it out, celebrating the diversity of both sides, or anything that isn't simultaneously and stridently anti-colonial and anti-capitalist. These are the master's tools. When death tolls rise to over 750,000 people from the spread of a largely preventable illness, there's only one side, one struggle, one imperative, Shut it down. The second half of Glenn Cuthard's quote states, and for capitalism to die, we must actively participate in the construction of indigenous alternatives to it. In other words, decolonization and abolition aren't simply calls to destroy. They are demands to care, to make kin and nourish relations as a means of creating and maintaining social arrangements that enable life and breath. 
This is the part where we need to focus, where we need to work to resuscitate the radical imagination. We're in desperate need of alternative and parallel spaces for learning that don't replicate the originary violences at the same time they enable the mass mobilization of subjugated knowledges. The good news is that we have models and experiences to build upon. There's the Black and Indigenous Freedom Schools in Okwesasne, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and Chicago. There's Freedom University, Critical Resistance, the Debt Collective, the Debt Collective and the Comisión Multisectorial de Reforma Universitaria, PADAS, Protest Amos, and DEMOS. There are the Indigenous Land Camp land-based land learning camps like De Chinta and the Defenders of the Water School and models of organization and leadership like the Combahee River Collective and the Red Nation. Radical modes of study and struggle demonstrate how to engage knowledge and knowledge making beyond the scope of imperial and productive logics and also cultivate modes of praxis that defend and support well-being. These aren't the safe spaces of liberal desire but rather pedagogical safe houses where intergenerational participants reckon with the foreclosures of racial capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism as a shared pedagogical project. The operating assumption is that people come to consciousness through fermenting and fomenting liberation, through enticing the connections between love, study, and struggle. The aim is not the individualist construct of learning, but the collective and immersive space of study a practice of gathering and organizing for the purposes of freedom. Study is also fundamentally emplaced and so begins with the question, whose land are you on? Who lives in your community and how did they come there? Who's in your home and who has never been in your home? Interlude six. Standing, unsettling, abolishing borders. This is the last one, so let's give it some vigor. So what if instead of building bigger and better learning management systems and data dashboards, we committed to creating a system of free tiny red libraries filled with books on liberation are painted or painted indigenous place names across all the roads and walkways in our towns and universities or planted vegetable and flower gardens in the front of every lawn stoop and city sidewalk, or organize a network of small intergenerational study circles in every empty backyard, high school, gym, stadium, church, mosque, and synagogue across the nation. Together we would learn and live the principle of from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. I know some of you might be wondering, but how do we credential that? Well, why would we? <laughs> For what purpose? What are you really trying to assess and why not turn those impulses toward building an evaluative system that we can all get behind? Like quantifying how many lives have been killed by capitalism or the cost of epistemicide, of indigenous language loss and the suffering of deferred dreams. So in this morning, you might also wonder what happens to the university of old, to the university as such. Here I turn to the world words of James Baldwin in the fire next time. He writes, it seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the fact of death, ought to decide indeed to earn one's death by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. But white Americans don't believe in death, and this is why the darkness of my skin so intimidates them. And this is also why the presence of the Negro in this country can bring about its destruction. It is the responsibility of free men to trust and to celebrate what is constant. Birth, struggle, and death are constant, and so is love, though we may not always think so and to apprehend the nature of change, to be able and willing to change. I speak of change not on the surface, but in the depths, change in the sense of renewal. But renewal becomes impossible if one supposes things to be constant that are not. Safety, for example, or money or power. One clings then to chimeras by which one can only be betrayed and the entire hope, the entire possibility of freedom disappears. And by destruction, I mean precisely the abdication by Americans of any effort to really be free. In other words, the death of the university need not be a tragedy. Maybe it's an inevitability. We owe it the honor of letting it die. It's lived a full life, one worth mourning, grieving, and celebrating for the renewal that will come. Maybe not inevitably, but with and through struggle, it will come. We certainly can and should manage the process of its dying with care. In 2014, I hospiced my mom, so I, I have a sense of what such a process entails. It's its own kind of reckoning, a place of mercy one enters after recognizing that the life lived is no longer sustainable, and when we can face and acknowledge the state of its decline. 
Maybe the time has come to reckon with the decline of the university and to consider its hospicing. Toward this end, I share the words of Vanessa Andriotti, Sharon Stein, Kasia Henneke, and Dallas Hunt, who write about hospicing as part of a cartography of responses to modernity and modernist institutions. They write, Hospicing entails sitting with the system in decline, learning from its history, offering palliative care, seeing oneself in that which is dying, attending to the integrity of the process, dealing with tantrums, incontinence, anger, and hopelessness, cleaning up and clearing the space for something new. This is unlikely to be glamour a glamorous process. It will entail many frustrations, an uncertain timeline, and unforeseeable outcomes without guarantees. Hospicing demands or critique that is self-implicated rather than heroic, vanguardist, or innocent. It demands a kind of courage that is unneurotic, not invested in self-affirmation. A kind of courage that helps us to look the bull in the eye, to recognize ourselves in the bull, and to see the bull as a teacher, precisely when it's trying to kill us. So whatever this time has meant, we all need to collectively make sure that we do not return to normal, that we do not prolong the life of dead ideas, or in the words of Arundhati Roy, that we do not continue trying to stitch our future to a past in a manner that refuses to acknowledge the rupture, because the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Pandemics have historically found, forced a break with the past and the time space to imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And she continues on, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. I would only add that beyond another world, we can walk through and embrace the otherwise, the elsewhere. For this, we must be ready. We must be willing to serve as andois, as death doulas, and as courageous warriors, because the future is ours for the making. This is the beginning. We want to thank Sandy for her gift, her brilliance. For sharing space, knowledge, and making a way for us, for urging us and reminding us of what can be. And so we ask that you come up here. We have gifts in our way to honor you and give thanks and share with you. Once again, let's have a round of applause for Sandy Grande and her brilliance. 
We thank you all for being here this morning, this last ASH keynote, uh, after what I'm sure was an eventful and fun night, uh, but for showing up in these spaces uh, and for sharing in knowledge. Uh, so thank you all. Enjoy your sessions today. And if we don't see you, safe travels home.